Censorship is the practice of suppressing communications or parts of communications for whatever reason. Often it comes from the government, but it can also come from the media, private institutions, businesses, and perhaps the widest form of censorship is self-censorship. Without which, we might all be walking around calling each other fuck. <laughs> Now I think it's important to note that censorship from governmental bodies has existed for as long as governmental bodies. Even in the freest societies, censorship has always existed. State secrets are the norm, and they're probably a good thing, at least in some capacity. Governments don't tell their citizens they've started watching a drug trafficking ring, and there'll be raids about Tuesday. The missile silos aren't on any public maps. All the confiscated child pornography isn't available for casual perusal. The problem is some governments also silence dissent, deny permits for demonstrations, or help journalists achieve frontal lobe failure. Anything can be censored, depending on a country's laws, or circumventing that, the will of the ruling class. In 1980, an Israeli law passed stating that artwork couldn't use the four colours of the Palestinian flag. That wasn't lifted until 1993. No word on if it's okay to use those four colours with a little bit of glitter. Just as anything can be censored, it can be censored in a number of ways. Things can be overtly banned, but they can also be covertly banned. A company might say it's open to different political views, but screen and fire employees who voice beliefs it doesn't like. Maybe one of the subtlest ways of censoring something is to ignore it. Don't give a political candidate a place in a debate. Don't acknowledge something that's happened, no matter how obvious it is. Before the internet, the methods of sharing information or ideas were limited. You had books, magazines, TV shows, and films, all of which usually had deep connections with the political establishment, and those connections were necessary for those industries to survive. Acquiring a far-reaching public voice was hard to do, and although you could self-publish, although you could print flyers, and you could even make a TV commercial and buy some airtime, before the internet, the normal person on the street was the recipient of information, not the creator of it, and not a node to pass it on. And the internet changed that. The excitement about the internet, back when it began to emerge. Was about the ability to freely share information and to connect with anyone. Even now, that's what the internet really is all about. Even if people are shit posting or trolling, they're still communicating and they're still sharing and creating information. Maybe that information isn't immediately useful, but it informs observers of a mindset. It can reveal a way of thinking. It can be analysed. The study of why some memes catch on and why some don't is a study of humour, of trends, of emotional intelligence, of how pop culture can be applied well or badly. The internet was like the Wild West; it came ahead of civilization. Suddenly, you didn't have to stand on street corners handing out badly photocopied leaflets about your asinine beliefs and observations. You could make a blog or a video and post it to the internet. Maybe and probably you'd be ignored, lost forever into the online ether. But the important part is that it bypassed the previous checks to mass communication. If you had an earnest manuscript about how Hitler was the second coming of Jesus, you can bet in 1990 and in the current times, very few publishers would touch that. But in 1990, that'd be it. Now it doesn't matter. You can put it up online somewhere, and if you publicise it. You'll have some people read some of it, even if it's just to laugh at it. It will probably reach someone, but importantly, it has the potential to. If you live in a village that you rarely leave, with most of your information of the outside world coming through the TV or your local pub, you're probably going to have a point of view that isn't so much limited as it is greatly filtered. With the internet, that changed. You can find people who believe anything, and will tell you all about it. There are thousands of different news sites, millions of different perspectives. In societies where information is heavily restricted, such as China, 
The internet offered a window to the rest of the world, looking in and out. In fact, that's not necessarily even to do with censorship. It enabled people from around the world to connect for the first time in an immediate way. The problem is the internet is no longer a crutch for finding information. It is now the main source of information. It's not just a place for trading speculation about the tang of the moon's cheese. It's information and rumor exchange, and obviously that undercuts any of the government's efforts to control information or to censor it. Most governments were pretty slow in responding to the internet, and in oppressive governments, this allowed for a window of opportunity where its citizens could communicate with the outside world and could really see what was going on. Although we live in a world where WikiLeaks continues to exist, for the most part, the windows of opportunity for those living in oppressive societies have been closed. The time of being able to post and publish absolutely anything, no matter how illegal, in free societies is ending or has ended. The list of different laws brought in by different countries over the last twenty years is far too extensive and boring to go through here. A lot of them are completely standard extensions of laws preventing people defrauding others. However, there are a few examples I think worth pointing out. Some of these examples are more to do with surveillance than censorship, but they do connect. In 1996, in the U.S., the Communications Decency Act prohibited publishing indecent or offensive images in online public places, things like forums or discussion pages. That was overturned by the Supreme Court the following year. The U.S.'s notorious Digital Millennium Copyrights Act of 1998. Criminalized the provision of certain access to copyrighted material. To this day, the DMCA is abused by individuals and companies, large and small, to yes, prevent unauthorized dissemination of their property, but also block content that falls into the magical land of copyright exemption, namely fair use. In the same year, Russia issued a decree requiring internet service providers facilitate their security services in monitoring Russian citizens' communications without a warrant. In the UK in 2000, a similar act, the RIPA, gave UK intelligence and policing agencies similar power, but with a warrant, but not a warrant from an independent court, a warrant from the Home Secretary or a senior member of staff. How does this relate to censorship? Well, in 2014, RIPA was used by UK police to access journalists' phone records to identify undisclosed sources in two separate cases relating to two separate ministers of Parliament. Not censorship itself, but a deliberate act to discourage further whistleblowing and passing on information to journalists. After 9/11, the Patriot Act, amongst other things. Broadened the use of telephone and internet surveillance, removing previous warrant requirements under the condition that info likely to be obtained would be pertinent to ongoing investigations. Countries such as France and the UK implemented data retention laws requiring internet service providers to log websites users have visited. Again, not censorship, but steps where governments further control and monitor the internet. In 2003, the Egyptian government illegalized the deliberate dissemination of news, statements, faulty or ill-motivated rumors, or agitating news, essentially voices of dissent. In the same year, India began blocking websites on mass, including pornographic sites, gambling sites, and many others. In 2011, Cisco Systems was accused in a lawsuit. Of helping China build a massive firewall created to control Chinese citizens' internet experiences, Chinese authorities routinely practice cyber disappearance, whereby dissenting online content coming from within China is removed without notice or explanation. In Turkey, Mr. Freedom himself, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, has given the world a tremendous example of how to roll back freedoms in a democratic country. As well as how to suppress the liberal ends of academia and the judiciary, after the failed coup of 
or the false flag operation created purely for political theater and for Erdogan to consolidate his power, depending on what you believe, more than 100 media outlets were shut down, including their online arms. The internet has since been shut down in certain regions for days at a time, and online dissent and information sharing has been silenced. Really, in terms of government interference online, you have two scales. One where the government actively censors. Places like the USA or Germany are on the free end of that scale. And on the other end, places like Saudi Arabia or China, or increasingly Turkey. But there's also a scale of surveillance. And in those terms, the USA and UK are really on the same end of the scale as China. The USA and UK may not be censoring, but they are watching. In the West, I'd argue government censorship online is a very valid issue of debate, especially with laws surrounding online hate speech coming into play or being amended in various countries. But I think the largest source of potential censorship in free societies isn't really from government, but from corporations. The internet is the corporate battleground of this era, and it has become monopolized by the same recurring names. Facebook has long been accused of censoring journalists, right-wing discussion groups, and individuals. Often, people say that Facebook, or other social media, is stifling freedom of speech. And often the counter-argument to that is that freedom of speech is a matter of law. That Facebook is a private company, and that it cannot stop people expressing themselves how they want to, off of Facebook. However, social media is incredibly important to how people form and share opinions. Over 60% of American adults use social media to find their news, and half of Americans use Facebook to find their news. Yes, Facebook, Twitter, Google, and its subsidiary, YouTube, are privately owned. They can do what they want, censor what they want, and they censor things all the time. Whether they really have political bents, as some say, I'm not sure. I think in some cases, probably elements within these big companies do have a political bent and do exercise terms of service unjustly to target people that they don't like or beliefs that they don't agree with. However, I think on a whole, corporate censorship of the internet, of their own products, is much more to do with advertising and keeping advertisers and with their own image. Recently on YouTube, there's been a wave of demonetizations, many of which are now being rolled back. Many view this as an attempt to sanitize YouTube, and yes, that's what it is. But it's not to get rid of naughty words, but to monetize videos that are valuable to advertisers. Although they may not have the power of governments, the reason corporate censoring of content is dangerous is because Google, Amazon, and Facebook essentially have a monopoly over what they do. If Google completely knocks you off its search engine, yeah, there's others, but that's your online business done. If Facebook deletes your account because you wrote a negative article about a public individual, yeah, you can go and write it somewhere else or publish a link to it somewhere else, but that's a huge audience lost. If Amazon delist your items, your own online shop is never going to be able to have the same reach. At the same time, the debate between net neutrality and market freedoms may well threaten these. And who knows, maybe one day Facebook will be its own internet service provider. I always thought I'd leave Facebook with a bang when Mark Zuckerberg runs for president and I make a 60 minute episode of the Bizarre Summary just about him. Oh, hi Mark. Now I think I should say, these companies do have terms of service, and they are required to censor some things by law. Recently, Germany passed a bill compelling social media companies to remove hate speech within a week, or face up to a 50 million euros fine. Some say it's a bill that could stifle freedom of expression on those platforms. A bizarre development considering many consider that bill to be a punitive one passed by Germany to punish Facebook for spying on its citizens. I think Facebook or Google allegedly deleting posts or altering search results is important, but it would be far less important if these companies 
didn't have a stranglehold on how most people use the internet. The internet was once 10 million people chatting to each other through a million different megaphones. Now it's 3 billion people chatting to each other through a handful of megaphones. It could once circumvent state censorship. Now it is a tool of it. It could once be a place to talk about things you'd never talk about offline. Now everything you say informs the type of adverts you're shown. Are governments censoring the internet? Yes, to varying degrees. Are the owners of the world's most popular websites censoring and surveying behind the scenes? Yes. Facebook and YouTube will become more controlled in the coming years. I don't think they will necessarily roll out mass censorship to the extreme. I don't think that's a profitable thing to do. It doesn't matter, though, because it's the potential that's the problem. What do you guys think about this? You can leave a comment below. It probably won't end up in a dossier all about your thoughts and beliefs, but it might get deleted by Google automatically. So don't make it too long. As ever, thank you for joining me. Don't forget to leave a like. And join me next time where I'll be discussing the phenomena that is, that was, Princess Diana. See you then. Uh, I, I, am, I am not a lizard, um, but, you know, keep the high quality comments coming in.